Well, uh, thank you, Katie, for the opportunity. And let's start with the, uh, the topic for today's class is going to be semantics. And sometimes, you know, you got this idea, and I've heard it, that semantics is something that is kind of like uh, superficial and not important when you're dealing with, uh, with the real substance of what we want to talk about. Sometimes people say, oh, well, that's just a matter of semantics. But semantics is actually a very important, it's very important because as you can read the title, semantics is the way in which language links to reality. So you can have the structure of the language, you can have uh, the sounds of the language, but at the end you need to know how language is going to grab those words, those constructions, and it's going to be attached to some representation in reality. So what I want to talk about today, a little bit, I suppose, because the topic could be just sort of inexhaustible, I want to talk about how language relates to reality based mostly on the words we use. So we're going to talk a lot about lexical semantics. So let's start. So what is meaning, and everybody I suppose knows, you know, uh, where this image comes from. You know it? Where did it come from? <laughs> Humpty Dumpty, okay, from Alice in Wonderland. And this is a very interesting, you know, uh, Lewis Carroll was actually an expert in, in logic, symbolic logic. And besides liking to take pictures of uh, little girls, he also liked, you know, writing uh, fiction and logic. So, when I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. Well, the question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be mastered, that's all. So you have here, you know, you have here a problem between um, what do we want words to mean and if words could mean many different things. Do you think words could mean many different things at the same time? For instance, an example? Color. Color? Color, like... That like color green? Well, I mean, like color green or color person, or there's so many different levels. Oh, excellent. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know that color was actually, you know, you know <coughs> English is not my native language, but color, I only use color as color green. But it means something else then? Hmm, that's interesting, I learned something new today. And another word that you could use in many different ways? Facebooking. Facebooking? Like it is the stalker version of Facebooking? <laughs> French friendly version of Facebooking? I suppose that's true. And so you can see that the problem with Humpty Dumpty is that he wants to he wants to master, he wants to control individually the way words mean. Is that possible? Can we have can we exert individual control over over words meaning? What's the problem with that? Can I decide, you know, I decided that today the word, I don't know, the word uh, pimple means this object here. And I'm going to go around talking, yeah, you know, like this pimple is awesome, you know, it's good to, what? Can I do that? No, what do I need to do? To make a word, you know, to make the meaning of a word understandable, I have to Mm, okay, individual and then what? Uh, context. context and we have to share the context. There is a shared, there is a shared element. There is a conventional element. So there is a representational level. We represent things. We give names to things. We represent to those representations. But those representations must be shared. There should be a convention, and that's a problem there. So meaning then is what you understand. It's what you understand when something is said. So meaning is related to understanding. And also, we have to think about if we have only one way of understanding things, of understanding language, of understanding what is said. And what I just said before is to understand, we need to have representations, but also we need to share those representations in the form of conventions. The first, word, the first way in which we're going to do some understanding is related to how language expresses an objective point of view related to reality. We want to have some kind of objective idea. We, have to have, we want to have a very straightforward representation of what we're saying so we can be understood. For instance, uh, we have to talk about the weather today and I can say something like, well, it's raining outside, so if you can see outside of the window, can you tell me, is that correct? 
Do I know, if I say, hmm, it's raining outside, do you think I know what the expression it's raining outside means? I mean, if I just look outside and say, no, because, because it's not raining, then it's false. My, my statement can be considered true or false. And if I know how to use language properly to relate language to reality, then I can have an expression and tie it to reality in a way that would be true or false. For instance, Rice University is located in Houston, Texas. If I say that a statement is true or false, it's true because for all intents and purposes, as of today, this building and everything is located here, but it could happen that one day, you know, a tornado comes in and it moves everything to Oklahoma. It is possible, and then we're going to have to say, well, actually, no, it's not true. But as of, the, as, of, as of today, the situation is as described. Then, what a funny thing, your whiteout is pregnant. If I say that, what a funny thing, everybody knows what, what a whiteout is? What out is? Okay, oh, your whiteout is pregnant. True or false? Is it true if I say that? That would be awesome. That would be awesome, you know, you know who, you know, but I would, I would know who was responsible, you know, for getting, you know, whiteout pregnant, it's kind of, you know, like a, an awesome task to perform. But uh, no, actually it can't. It can't be true. So one thing that is important is that we can approach meaning as the relationship between what we know, what we know about reality, and then see if reality matches the description provided in the statement. That's a possibility. However, this is a very restrictive and a very straightforward connection that goes one to one between language and reality. And the thing that, con that controls that kind of uh, matching is the notion of truth. And in order to do that, we need to know a lot of logic, symbolic logic, so we can actually predict, you know, and we can, uh, we can, um, the word would be map, or we can describe properly in formal terms what's the relation between a statement and reality. However, think about the, uh, the white out again. Reality can be a little bit fussy, okay? Sometimes it's not easy to determine what things are and if they are true or false because we actually want to talk about things in a more suggestive way, okay? So your white out is pregnant, again. Do you think that makes sense? Somehow, not impossible. Is that a white out? Yes. It looks pretty pregnant to me. What can I say your wife is pregnant in this kind of situation and the sentence is not, oh, that's false. You laugh. It makes sense. Remember that. It, it's making sense. Why does it make sense? <coughs> it's kind of like a bulbous sort of container. So okay, it's a white out. Kind of like swollen like Okay, so uh, you know, it's like this, this, uh, the silhouette, the shape reminds us of a pregnant woman. So we can say it's pregnant. Of course, you know, this is an extension in the meaning. I'm representing, I'm providing some information that is matched to some reality, but not only to talk about it if it is true or false, it's because I want to be creative, I want to suggest more information with the language I'm using. It's not only that I want, you know, to go from reality to language, and be, or, visit, or vice versa, by saying it's true or false. So as we can say, there is, nothing to, there is nothing to say in terms of being true or being false. It's more, it's more related to the way we represent things or what we want to convey. Remember, it's about understanding. What do we understand by this? So there are plenty of more cases of reality on fuzzy, and what I want to say, what I want you to understand at this point is, not that reality can be a uh, hotspot of things you know, that we cannot define very well, which actually it can be. But the thing is that we have to use language to deal with those situations, and we use language creatively. For instance, everybody knows, uh, everybody here knows what Catholics do on Good Friday? What they can eat, what they cannot eat? Please? Okay, yeah, Catholics can't eat meat, red meat, but they can eat fish. Okay? So there was a moment in which I remember clearly my brother and I were sitting on a table, Good Friday, and we were expecting, okay, we're going to eat fish. And then, my, and then my mother brings, you know, something she made that had this. 
And my brother said, come on, this is not fish. And my mom, of course it's fish, it's tuna. But this is not fish, you open a can, you know, I want fish. <laughs> my brother was thinking of this fish, good fish, not the bad fish. A good fish swims, has scales, you know, fins and everything. That doesn't look like fish to me at all. <laughs> but it's fish. And you can see that it makes sense. The discussion, you know, of course, you know, since I like semantics, I was so happy that I was like, oh, can I record you guys? Because it was really awesome that my mom was, ah, but this is fish. And my brother, no, no, you know what I mean. I want, I want real fish. So both are fish. If you can check, you know, the, I don't know, the molecules and the, you know, the DNA, everything. It's like, okay, tuna or whatever it is. Perhaps it was not tuna. Who knows? My mom was, wanted to go cheap sometimes. So, uh, and then you have the real fish. So what's the difference, you know, why is this, what, what's the fuss about? What do you think, you know, like, give me an idea, why is it a valid discussion? You know, say, ah, oh, come on, that's a stupid discussion. However, as a discussion, it still makes sense. Why do you think it makes sense? Ideas, suggestions, why? Hmm, please, again. Maybe the catfish feels less special. Like, since it's Good Friday, it's a special occasion, so somehow the ordinariness of a canned, canned tuna is not as like, appealing as like, a real cold fish. Excellent. Excellent point of view because in some sense, yeah, the, the context in which, in which we, you are assuming that you can eat something like fish makes it special. So this, this thing you are calling fish is not the thing I'm expecting to be called fish. And actually a fish, you know, like they say, if you want to teach a kid, you know, okay, now I'm going to teach you how to draw fish. I don't draw a can, I don't go like, oh, that's a fish, you know, like, throw it in the water and it's going to swim, I, I guess. No, you, you need to draw something like the other fish, like the good fish. But there is a scale of things that we think are more correct, or let's put another word, correct is not a good word for linguistics, actually, it's more appropriate. Or we think it's more basic to our knowledge of fish. A fish that has been processed is less real or less natural of fish, not a fish that can swim or looks as if it could. So, what I've been talking about so far is the difference between sense and reference, or at least one way to look at the difference between sense and reference. So, when I was talking about how language relates to reality in a one-to-one -one relationship that could be measured by using a criterion of true or uh, validity or, uh, or falsity, let's put it like that, true or false, that is reference. If we can talk about things, if we can use language to refer, that means to point at things out there in the real world, then we can use language to do that and we can talk about the meaning of an expression. For instance, uh, if I talk about, let's go just to this part here, okay? Let's go just to this. The morning star refers to the planet Venus. Everybody knows what the morning star is. You know, in the morning, very, you know, like before the crop of dawn, you can see outside and you can see this bright star. And that bright star actually is the planet Venus. So there is a thing outside in the world, or the, what we consider to be the universe, that corresponds to the expression of the morning star. However, we also have to say that the evening star is the planet Venus. So we have that the expression, the morning star, and the expression, the evening star, both refer to the same object, to the same reality, correct? However, and that thing is informative. We can say, oh, I didn't know before that the morning star and the evening star were the same thing. So the reference is shared. However, if I say something like, Venus is Venus, that is not informative. That is a, that is a tautology. I don't get any information. However, both the reference is the same. If I say something like, for instance, if I say, of course, you know, the evening star is the morning star, that informs me of something. Because even if those two, even if those two expressions, morning star and evening star, have the same reference, they have different senses. That's the point. If, they, if, you, have, if you have a linguistic expression, the linguistic, the linguistic expression can refer to something in reality, but there is an attached, you know, there is something added up to it, and it's a sense what you understand about it. So that's why, you know, 
At one level, you have pure tautology, and at, uh, at another level, you can have some really informal statement. So, the difference here is the same as do you remember set theory when you talk about uh, defining a set by extension and by indention? Do you remember that? So, what is the set of the planets? You can define it by extension, and you can say, well, the set of the planets is Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Neptune, and that's it. Pluto was demoted, so it's going to never report Pluto, no loss of Pluto anymore. And you can also, that's extension of the set, but you can actually define it by, by intention and saying, you know, like only X is a member of the solar system and is a planet. And that's, that's all you need. That is, that's the sense. Okay? That's the difference. So, besides that, there is also another way of understanding. So we, we saw, we just saw how we can understand things based on the reference, linguistic expressions have reference, but we can also talk about how we understand things in terms of how we are using language and how it relates to, for instance, distinctions like if somebody says groovy and somebody says cool, then we can say what about that, those people? If somebody says groovy and somebody says cool, what would you think about somebody using the word groovy? Probably older. Okay, or desperately, you know, out of fashion. <laughs> and cool is still fine, I suppose. Do you still, do you still use the word cool? Okay, fine. <laughs> so the word rat, for instance, was like 90s or something. I suppose you can tell, you know, something about, you know, the age, you know, you know, the age uh, that person belongs to. Also, if you have something like you ain't seen nothing yet versus you haven't seen nothing yet versus you have not seen anything yet. Like all those uh, expressions, what, you, what can you tell about them? What, kind of, what, what, is, what are they suggesting to you? Remember that by suggesting I'm saying, what do they make you understand? Which is the thing we're talking about. What do you understand, you know, what's, do they mean the same? Yeah, they mean the same at a referential level. They are expressing the same kind of reality. Once again, at a referential level, they mean the same, because we're talking about meaning as reference. However, I was telling you that there are also other ways of understanding things that go beyond the referential level. So if somebody uses those expressions, what are you understanding about that person? What can you say? There is a very quickly, there is a very, you know, uh, useful thing, you know, we like to say about people, you know, oh, that is, when somebody says something that you think, oh, he looks like he's not well, or she's not well educated, or I wouldn't use those terms, you know, in front of the president of the university, or I wouldn't talk to my grandmother that way, I would talk to my friends that way. You're talking about the style, okay? The style the person uses, correctness, incorrectness, or pretty much formality or informality. That, that's information that also language can convey. There is, besides that, there is another way of understanding that is related to, and this is also in uh, Finnegan's book, it is related to the distinction between connotation and denotation. So pretty much connotation and denotation, when you think hard about it, is very, very similar, virtually the same thing as the difference between reference and sense. The denotation can be considered to be the objective way in which you are representing something. Okay? Whereas the connotation is what is implied, what is suggested by the use. So, you know, the famous philosopher Bertrand Russell once was asked in a radio interview, what's the difference between denotation and connotation? And, and he said, well, the difference between denotation and connotation is this. And he said, I am firm, you are obstinate, and he's a thick headed fool. So, I am Connotation depends on how you want to portray a supposedly shared core meaning. Okay? So when you're talking about the core meaning, most likely the best way to represent a core meaning is assuming the reference of the term. So what kind of objective reality you are descriptive by the languages. So 
if you say fern, fern oxygenate pig headed. They are pretty much, you know, the same thing, and the difference is how do you suggest as how do you portray it? Is it a positive quality or is it a negative quality? If it's a positive quality, we are fair here. If it's if it's not that positive, you're oxygenate. If it's really bad, then you're pig headed. And the same can go for the other one. I'm a perfectionist, you're an anal, and he's a control freak. Pretty much you're talking about the same kind of attitude towards, you know, being neat, being clean, being organized, but one is positive and the last one is particularly negative. Nobody wants to be called a control freak, but everybody wants to be a perfectionist. Okay? I you know dislike that word perfectionist, sometimes I'm a little overwhelming. So Let's go to the semantics in language. We're going to talk about today uh, mostly about lexical semantics, and that's what I want to focus the, the lecture today. And of course, we're going to talk about how words, how those tiny elements, you know, that convey meaning, okay, that you mix together to, to make sentences and, and text, how they are organized, and how we can trace relationships, relations between them, between the elements. Because our knowledge of the lexicon, the lexicon is a fancy word we language use for a dictionary. Like a dictionary in your head, that's the idea of a lexicon. So how is it organized? I'm going to talk about it in a minute. But also in your book, you're going to find about sentence meaning, the grammatical semantics. So to illustrate that, we can see the difference, because I won't talk about it, I'm just going to give you an idea of what it is about is what's the difference between tragically Peter died and Peter died tragically? If everybody here speaks English, I hope so. This distinction should be pretty clear. Otherwise, I don't know English and I just made a huge mistake. Please? Suggestions? What's the difference? Please? The first one, uh, Peter died and it's tragic. But the second one, it's he died in a tragic, tragic fashion. Absolutely. Well, well put. So the first one, look at the position of the, of the adverb, tragically, has scope, that's a technical term, has scope over the expression Peter died. So the fact that Peter died is what we are calling tragic. Whereas Peter died tragically, tragically only has a scope over died. So we're saying that the way in which he died was tragic. And oh, that's a, a minute difference, of course. It is one. But we can, we can create the difference by the position of a word in a sentence. And there are plenty of other ways in which, in which we, can talk about, um, we can talk about grammatical meaning. For instance, the meaning of a suffix, the meaning of a pronoun. It's, it's way more complex because it's more abstract. Whereas words tend to have nouns, verbs, adjectives, they tend to have a more concrete meaning. So, for lexical semantics then, we're going to talk about how we have things organized in the lexicon. So we're going to do a very quick experiment so you can see how things might be organized, okay? So I'm going to say a word and then you have to tell me something that comes immediately to your mind. So a very simple experiment. If I say boy, you say... Dog. If I say cat, you say dog. If, you, if I say finger, you say yes. hand. If, you say, if I say hot, you say cold. cold. Why don't you say sexy? <laughs> <laughs> Is it possible to say hot, sexy? Are those, are those related? Yes. Yeah, of course. They are related, but as you can see, let's, let's assume, you know, let's see if I can do a little drawing here. Let's assume that you can have a word here, okay? And this is the word hot. And let's talk about the neighborhood of the word hot. So, if this is the neighborhood, what do you think is going to be inside of that neighborhood? Dog? Hot dog? Hot dog. <laughs> excellent, excellent, it works. What is going to be inside of the neighborhood of that word, of that concept? We're talking about concepts here, very important thing. Things in your head, concepts. What do you think is going to be most or more likely to be in the same neighborhood? What other word? Cold, tepid, 
warm, heat, words that are related to what field? Temperature. Temp. Excellent. Excellent. So we're going to have here, oh, I was going to write on the, on the wrong screen. You're going to have temperature here, and you're going to have cold, and then you're going to have warm, etc., etc., etc. And then temperature might be, you know, linked to what? As a big field, you can talk about temperature, weather, excellent, weather, and then you're going to keep multiplying the connections. So the idea is that your knowledge of words is a massively intricate network of concepts. But they are not, you know, tied in a very, you know, with an easy way. They have to be tied with certain structure. Some words are very similar to each other. Warm is kind of similar to hot. Okay? What's more than hot? Water. <laughs> <laughs> Good uh, <laughs> Now, you're, you're using grammatical semantics now. You're using a suffix. Okay? Is there a word, you know, that you could say, a word, only a word, one token that you could use for something that is more than hot? Feverish, ardent, I don't know, a smoldering? Point. Boiling. Hmm? Boiling. Wow, I didn't know that one. But there is, there is something there. Wow. So the idea is that words have relationship among them. Go here. Mm -hmm. And they seem to be organized accordingly in terms of similarity, inclusiveness, inclusiveness opposition, like hot and cold, complementariness, I suppose, like boy and girl. And etc. that we're going to see right now. It is important to have this in mind because this kind of knowledge allow, allow us to actually make sense of what we're talking about. And then we can, we are in some sense ready to follow up the flow of information. When we're talking about boys and we're talking about, it's very likely that they are going to also talk about girls, if we're talking about marriage, it's very likely that somebody's going to talk about a wife, if somebody's going to talk about a husband. So we get, you know, it's like getting your, uh, what do you say? how do you say that? It's like getting your file ready. It's like getting all the information ready, just being, so just, so, so that we are more efficient when we produce and when we understand language. So you can see a semantic field here, you know, this is for the British, for the British meaning of the word man. Okay, not for the English one. Or not for the American one, sorry. What's the difference between man in British English and of course you can see and the American way of using man? Angry versus crazy. Yeah, that's right. Man here is angry. And there is it's crazy. So those are all words that are in some sense related to the word man. It's part of the neighborhood of being mentally deranged or something of sorts. Okay? So the idea is that you cannot say that all those words are synonyms. They belong to the same semantic field, but they are not synonyms. What does a synonym mean? I suppose that's the next one. No, I couldn't. Well, I have to go back. So what, just uh, getting a little bit ahead. So what is a synonym? That's the most, the most basic one, the most basic uh, lexical relationship for words that you can talk about. What's a, what's a synonym? Two different words that mean the same thing. Two different words that mean the same thing. And in that case, you, don't, you cannot say, you know, the phrase that mad means the same as uh, schizophrenic. Schizophrenic has a different meaning in what sense? What would be schizophrenic? It's very much more specific. It's much more specific as some kind of you know mental state that is an alteration of reality. You think that there are two realities and you cannot put them together, or you cannot make sense of what you're listening, you're hearing your head. For instance, that's a very common situation with schizophrenia. But then they are similar but not the same. When something is supposed to be the same in referential terms, once again the word reference comes back. If you're talking about two different words that have a same reference, then you can say that they are synonymous, that they are synonymous words. However, when we organize words, and I want to talk about this in the next slide, we can talk about a basic level for the, uh, 
for the way we understand a word, for the way we understand a family of concepts. And there are some other words that are considered to be of more abstract, more abstract, higher level, and some other ones that are more specific level, more particular. So that's what I wanted to point out here. So if you go to the middle level, which is right here, you can see an owl, a hen, a lark, and a wren, which are specific kind of birds. However, a higher level is bird. And a lower level, for owl, for instance, is a snowy owl, a screech owl, a barn owl, and of course, the very old rice owl. It's a very important element, you know, part of the hyponyms, the subordinate terms. Why is this important? It looks a little bit like, man, this looks very silly, you know, it's like we have birds. We, everybody knows we have birds, and birds can be divided in species of birds, and then you have, like, more species that are more specific to, let's say, owl or hen. Why is this important? I'm going to give you two, two reasons why this is important. First, we know as a fact that when kids, when children learn language, they do not learn the higher level and they do not learn the lower level. They learn the basic one first because it's easier to relate. The level of specificity is too much for them to handle, the level of, the level of abstraction is too much for them to handle. Okay? So that's why, for instance, the word dad and the word man, which one has, which one is more specific? Dad is more specific. That's why, you know, and that's, that's why, you know, at some point, kids tend to mix things up. And that's why they can use dad, you know, to talk about every, every male. Because they are using the word dad instead of the word man, which would be a basic level. So it is not that the kid says, oh, that seems to be a basic, uh, seems to be a subordinate term, so I should, I should avoid using it. No, the, kid, the, child doesn't, the child doesn't think that way. He or she wants to use the word the way a, the way a basic level should be used. So the first uh, relationship we want to talk about is meroning. Meroning is part and whole. So you can see here a wheel, or perhaps, is it a wheel? Yeah, you have a wheel here. And then you can talk about all the parts, you know. To talk about hub, to talk about uh, spoke, to talk about ring, to talk about all A, B, and C, you need to know what a wheel is. The idea is that it is important to understand the whole, to understand the part. And that is, that is a way in which you talk about things that, that make, make, allow us to make sense. You talk about an apple, you have in your head, you know, the notion of a finger, and also, at a more background level, the notion of a hand. That's a relation, the relationship of Meroni. Meroni. Meroni, sorry. That's word. So, for synonyms and antonyms, the thing that I explained holds, but if you talk about referential identity between something like, just a second, between kill versus cause to die, if you kill, you're causing someone or some, or some living creature to die. Is that correct or not? Is kill synonym to cause to die? For instance, you know, if, uh, if somebody you know, pulls a gun you know, and shoots at somebody, you would say he killed that person? If the doctor you know, is you know, performing surgery and the patient dies, did the doctor kill the patient? If I, you know, if I do this, you know, if I decide, if I do this, I want to kill somebody, you know, but I want to create a perfect crime. So I want, I want to see, you know, that person is going through surgery, a very complicated surgery. So I will patiently wait until the day that person goes through surgery, and then I'm just going to go, you know, to the power plant, and I'm going to mess everything up. So during the time he has skill surgery, there is no power. And I also make sure, you know, that there is no power in the hospital, you know, like I mess around, you know, with the, I don't know, the emergency thing they have, and he dies because they cannot, they cannot do anything without power. Did I kill that person? You can see, you know, that it gets complicated to understand, you know, how we use the word kill. Sometimes it is better to say I'm caused to die because I'm putting myself in a more indirect position and not in a more direct or active position. So, really, there are no 
really there are not synonyms. Synonyms are, are some, your book is saying that there are synonyms at a referential level. But only, you know, if you talk about, for instance, no. If you're talking about one object and you give that same object two different names, for instance, uh, I don't know, how do you call the thing you drink? Uh, where are you from? Oh, excellent. So, <laughs> excellent, excellent. So, how do you call the thing that you drink, you know, like, a, I don't know, like a 7 up uh, Sprite? Um, Pop. Excellent. How are you from? Texas. From Texas. So, how do you call the thing you drink? When you, like a 7 up or a soda. A soda. Anybody from, from Georgia? Nobody? In Georgia, you can still hear people saying they drink Coke, even if it's not Coke. It could be a Sprite, it could be Pepsi, and it's still a Coke. I want a Coke. Which, which kind of Pepsi it is? I heard that and I was like, oh, no. they didn't teach me that, you know, when I was learning English. <laughs> but then, then you have to learn fast. So you can see, you have to learn fast, really. So this is an interesting thing because at that point, you can say, oh well, at a referential level, the word pop and the word soda refer to the same reality. However, okay, they are synonyms at a referential way, in a referential sense. But if you think about the information the word pop and the word soda give you, and the word coke, they tell you, oh, this person might be from the deep south, this person might be from the north or from the midwest, because in Indiana they also say pop, and this person might be somewhere else besides those areas, okay? That is important thing because then at a very, very, if you are very picky, there are no real synonyms. Antonym is, on the other hand, the relation between words that uh, talks, tells us about the opposition or complementariness between them. So you can have readable pairs like this one here, ugly and pretty, you can have ugly and pretty, and you can have everything in between, okay? And I was thinking that there are plenty of things you can have in between, you know? Attractive, you know, ugly, like horrible, nasty, whatever you want to say. And for those that are not gradable, usually adjectives, adjectives are those, are the ones that you can grade. But for those that you cannot grade, you have complete opposition, dead or alive, okay? So, because the opposition is, is, is in some sense logically attained or obtained because you say if you are alive, that means that you are not dead. And if you are not dead, that immediately means that you are alive. So, but that's the most core meaning. That's the most core meaning because sometimes people talk about, you know, I, the thing is half dead or something like that because it looks bad. So that's another way of talking that is not very precise. So the thing so far you know we're looking at is that there are ways of talking in which we convey information that wants to be very precise, very objective. But there, is also, there are also ways in which we talk that are not precise. And those are the most com complex ones. And those are the ones that tell you who knows how to speak a language and who doesn't. Those are the most creative ones. So conversion is also an interesting one. And I, of course, you know, I had to put something in Spanish, otherwise it wouldn't have to be. Um, Conversion is a relationship between two elements that are mutually implied. You cannot have this notion being true if you don't have this other notion being true at the same time. And in the, in the comic strip, you can say that the daughter is, is saying, why do I have to do it? And the mother says, well, because I say so, and I am your mother. And then she replies, well, if it's a matter of our degrees, then I am your daughter. And we graduated the same day, didn't we? Because what does it mean? What does it mean? We graduated the same day. The day I became a daughter, because she's the other, uh, she's, she's the oldest. The day I became a daughter, by definition, you became a mother. It's, it's unavoidable. The day you become a teacher, if you are a teacher, that means that you have students. The day you become a wife, that means that you have a significant other that is legally allowed to marry you in this model of <laughs> Not necessarily a husband. Okay? So you get the point. It is not that they are not antonyms. 
they are complementary because if one is true, the other one needs to be true. If it's true that this lady is a mother, it is true that she has a daughter. And if this is her daughter, it is true because she has a mother. Also, birth could, could uh, have that relationship. Give and receive are complementary in that sense. Give and receive. Okay? Talk and listen is not. Because you can talk and nobody listens sometimes. <laughs> as sad as it is. <laughs> but, so be careful with that. You have to, because the, the exercise or even the quiz is going for the test, is going to point out that you actually know how to define those elements. And the best bet you can have when you want to, to analyze this is let's go for the most core meaning, the referential one. If you're talking about somebody like it's a mother, it's a parent, you have to have you know, kids, children. Polysemy is interesting, but polysemy is the capacity of a word to mean several things, and those meanings are related because they have been extended through history or because creativity of the users. So the word palm is a very simple one that I, I put like plenty of words here. Most words are, are polysemies, really. So the word palm, you think about the tree. You think about uh, what is it, this part? Think about the tree first. So you can see a palm, you can see this figure, and then you can see your, the palm of your hand. So if you can think about the two things, the plant and the, the part of your, of your arm, you have to say that they, what? That what kind of relationship they hold? Physical structure. Physical structure, wow, oh, it's getting, we're getting technical here. Okay, there is some physical structure, of course, but let's go to a more, you know, basic level for a three-year-old. It's like, they kind of look the same. They, they kind of look the same because they share a structure. I, I give you that, it's true. So if they look the same, if there is something similar that we can relate to each other, then we can extend. Don't ask me which one was first. The palm of the tree or the palm of the hand. The idea might be, okay, you, you, might, you, might, you might get the point. Which one should be before? The palm of the hand or the palm of the tree? Hmm? Hand. Hand? Yeah. Then why do we have to say palm of the hand? <laughs> we should just say palm. The one that is the when you say palm tree, there's something that's a little hard to find that as well. Yeah. But the name of that tree is what, what kind of tree is that? It's a palm. Yeah, so that's the idea. The idea is it's more primitive in the sense of being reduced because it is less complex. That's always a good indicator when you are talking about polysemy. But also remember, polysemy is there is some relationship, like the word crown. So why do your why do your tooth have a crown? I don't think the tooth, you know, has you know God-given rights, you know, to rule a nation <laughs> because that's also a crown. Why do you talk about the crown of the tooth? It's a golden hat. <laughs> Okay, that's a good one. Some people, you know, some people like having like a golden tooth and stuff like that. Okay, that's kind of classic. <laughs> but uh, think about, you know, the structure of a tooth. Maybe it's something that surrounds it and has this, you know, top that is irregular. So it kind of look like, looks like a crown. So think that we are ex stretching the representation in order to create new meaning that allow us to talk about things that we need to talk about. If you're a dentist, you're going to talk about crowns every day and you're going to have uh, a big fan of Queen Elizabeth, perhaps. Yeah? Oops, what did I do? Oh, I pressed the wrong one. Homonymy is something different. Homonymy and polysemy are very much confusing because while polysemy is one word with different meanings because those meanings are somehow related by representation, by stretching, expanding the representation, homonymy means a situation in which there is a coincidence between two words that are spelled or uh, pronounced the same, but they have nothing to do with, it, with each other. It's just a historical coincidence, like the word peck. So the question here is, what's a peck? If you can read it, a bastard is a unit of weight equal to four pegs. What's a peck? A quick smooch. You know, I don't understand math at all. Of course, you know, like, a peg is not smooch. Well, it is smooch. 
But th those are two words that have different meanings, and they come historically from different sources. The one we're talking about here in the math run is, a peg is a measure of volume associated with dry goods. It is rarely ever used to measure liquids, blah, 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 blah. That is the definition of one meaning for peg. A homonym is the other one, a quick smooch. And how much do I have left? A couple minutes? Just like two minutes. Oh, okay. Okay, I wanted to play with this. So, when you talk about, when you use language to communicate, we're talking about what we understand. But sometimes we use language to understand abstract notions based on more concrete notions that we can easily manage. For instance, you know that uh, St. Augustine people had this famous saying about time. Uh, what then is time? If no one asks me, I know what it means. What it is. If I wish to explain it to him who asks, I don't know. Because time is a very abstract notion. So how do we talk about time so we can make ourselves understandable when we talk about time? Well, we use some concrete, some concrete notion, a source for me. And then we use it to express a target domain which is always abstract. So those are the technical terms. The source is concrete, the target is abstract. So, let's see how we do it. In English, time is a path you go through. That's how we understand time. Time is a path, and we walk through that path. We do the movie. So we talk about a brilliant future lies ahead of us. Because when we're walking, the future is in front of us and we walk towards the future, and we then leave things behind, which are left in the past, the word left, by putting behind. That's how, we, how, that's how we express that in English. However, in Quechua, in Southern Quechua, which is a language I study, time is a path you observe moving through. It's like one of those, how do you call like the thing you used to run, that you never move, but you don't keep moving? The treadmill. It's sort of like you stand here and time moves like a treadmill and you just observe things. So think about it. If you're standing here and time moves, things that are in the future are in front of you, of you or behind you. If you are standing still, you don't move. Time is the one that moves, like a treadmill. Things in the future are going to be worse. Behind you. And things in the past are going to be in front of you, because they just passed you by. So that's the way, that's how they organize time in Quechua. So the word for Nyaupa, Nyaupa Kruna means ancestor. And Nyaupa means to move forward. So the people that are behind us, in English, in Quechua, the people that are in front of us, and those are my ancestors. And when I talk about Kepa Kruna, that means my descendant, the people that go, that are behind me. You see, it's totally the opposite. I mean, time is money. That works in English and Spanish. We want to talk about time, we talk about money. <laughs> okay, so you, you get the idea when time is money. For instance, don't waste my time. Like this will save you a lot of time, etc. So you get the idea here that we are using, this is similar to homonymy, you see? We're using some notion that is very concrete and we expand the meaning to talk about something that is more abstract. So that's what we're, we talked about today when we talk about meaning and hope you enjoy the class. And if you have questions, you can ask me. <laughs>